When we look at Paul's life, uh, we don't get the idea that he sat around for long periods of time trying to figure out what to do next. He seems to be quite decisive and very active, you know, maybe almost a type A kind of personality, very focused. <clears throat> so I want to talk about Paul's direction here and um, how he made decisions and what were the factors that influenced these decisions about his ministry. Where is he going? Who is he working with? All those kinds of decisions that came up in his ministry. And actually, as we read through Acts and his epistles, there are multiple, multiple references that give us a hint about his thinking uh, and his priorities of how he's making these kinds of decisions. So let's start with that word strategy again. Um, <clears throat> Roland Allen uh, used the word methodology for Paul's missionary method um, and, and said Paul didn't have a strategy. Um, and, I, and Roland Allen was a very educated man and I think he was thinking about a very specific kind of strategy like maybe a military strategy or a governmental strategy or something like that. Um, so, I mean, what we see I, I, from what I read is Paul did not have a detailed step-by-step -step strategy in the modern business or military sense. You know, one that's 800 pages long and here's, you know, here's what we're going to do in step 27 after so-and-so and such. A, no, he Paul didn't have that. There were too many. I think there were too many factors, and he was too busy to write down 800 pages or even 80 pages of uh, direction about how he's carrying out his ministry. But we can see a consistency of direction with a flexibility in carrying out his ministry. Uh, for me, I think that that really is pointing to a, what I would refer to as a strategy, although not the former uh, type. So what factors influenced his decisions regarding this ministry? And I'm going to walk through a number of them with you uh, here in the next few minutes. Uh, the first one is his preparation. Uh, Paul had a very specific background and it certainly influenced how he went about his mission. We should remember that because we may not have the same preparation that he had or the same background and it would be difficult for me or someone else to do it like Paul in that sense, but in the sense of understanding who I am and who God, God has prepared to be his servant, uh, that does make sense. I want to think about those. Well, <clears throat> uh, it appears that Paul had multilingual training, at least bilingual training. Uh, he is extremely fluent in Greek, and he is a Hebrew of Hebrews, as he says, which probably means that he is completely at home in the Hebrew language as well. Uh, and he, he, I think it's likely that he probably also spoke some Latin because he was a Roman citizen and there would be all kinds of official pieces of his life as a citizen that would be done in that. So uh, he, he doesn't, like, like I had to do, go overseas and start learning languages. Uh, essentially where he did his ministry, language wasn't as big of an issue, uh, it is some. But he has this amazing bilingual training in his background. Um, he goes to Roman, Greek, and Jewish cities of commerce. Uh, he actually has a trade. He was trained to work and make his own living. Um, and so he is a Roman citizen. He comes from a Greek city and knows that culture and he is ethnically Jewish. So it's just sort of interesting to see all of these things coming together uh, in the places where he goes. He had a focused call to the nations. God specifically told him um, and he's going to be witnessing to the Jews, but his primary task is to take the story of Jesus 
to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish nations on earth. And this certainly, this background of this call uh, gave him very specific directions about what he's supposed to be spending his time doing. And then he has ministry experiences. Uh, from the very beginning, he starts confounding uh, the Jews in the synagogues because uh, he, he's an Old Testament expert, let's, let's just say it. I mean, he was trained by one of the best Old Testament uh, scholars in the history of the world. Um, and <clears throat> he learns from this very quickly. Uh, so he's, he's, he's bringing along his successes uh, wherever he goes. That's tremendous uh, background for how he goes about his ministry. Two, based on um, what he says and what he does, we can see that there are priorities. And Paul may not use that term, but he obviously really views these things as the highest value activities. What would that be? Well, <clears throat> to preach where Christ is not known. Um, you know, if Paul comes through a city where there's already an established church, he's going to teach there and he's going to help them and those kinds of things. But that's not where he's going to be spending most of his time. He's got to go to the pioneer places. That is a priority for the missionary apostle. And he's going to establish churches. He's not just going through and preaching about Jesus and he hopes a few individuals believe. No, when he starts ministry in a city, it is his objective that they're going to win people to Christ by proclamation, disciple those people, and then form a church of these new disciples of Jesus. That is an extremely high priority. And we can see that Paul deeply, deeply values the church. That's what he's trying to get to. Uh, and then later, this interesting that this uh, collection that the churches start raising uh, because God sent a prophet to them that told them that uh, Jerusalem, Palestine is going to be in a famine. It's going to be a very terrible thing. For those of us who live in America, it's hard to imagine a real famine. We freaked out when they, our favorite kind of beans in a can weren't available, you know, a year or two ago because of the supply chain. But most of us were not in a place where we were actually on the verge of starvation. Uh, this is probably what Jerusalem was about to face. And Paul, I think, wants the nations to show concern for their brothers and sisters in Christ who are Jews and believers back in Jerusalem. I personally think he's probably thinking of Isaiah 66, where the nations stream back to Jerusalem to bring some of their wealth to Jerusalem. But either way, this becomes a really high value uh, to Paul that uh, it's not the, the, the original church supporting the churches overseas. It's now those Gentile churches who are sending back not just support for Jerusalem, but basically disaster response uh, to help the Christians there survive what's going to be a, a terrible famine. And then we see it in his ministry, and then he speaks about it pretty clearly in Romans 15. Paul is thinking about geographic expansion. As we talked about the expansion of his ministry, uh, no, he is specifically thinking, I want to get to this province and we're going to go to this city and it's going, to, it's going to keep growing and growing and spreading and spreading and spreading. And even remember he calls it this sphere of his ministry. Uh, he's, he's, he's not getting caught in just one or two places. He knows that his ministry is to spread out, always moving forward. Uh, then we see, I believe, principles in Paul's life and ministry. Um, and we might say these are convictions that guided his ministry. And some of them, and they're all ones we know, right? The first one is the gospel saves. That, that's God's plan, is that this good news about Jesus saves people. And it yes, it works for the Jews first, but then also all the nations, all the Greeks. 
Um, we see in Acts 14 that he gets to a place where there's both response and there is reaction to that response. And when Paul sees both of those, he realizes that there's a spiritual battle going on here and he makes the commitment to stay longer because he's actually looking for a response and whenever there's response, he knows there's going to be opposition. So this is, this is a place of a spiritual fight and, and Paul wants to be a part of that. That seems to be a principle. Uh, and we know that he is planting indigenous churches. These are not churches that are dependent on some other church for support or leadership or anything like that. They're not even dependent long term on Paul and his leadership. He is raising up leaders very quickly and when we read Acts 14, I mean this looks like he's appointing elders in some of these churches that those elders can't be more than a year old in their faith and probably not that old in their faith uh, because the ch these churches have to turn to Christ, depend on God, and through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, they have to keep growing and ministering and reproducing themselves. And then we see this principle in Paul's life where he says, I have to become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul saw it as his role as the one sent out to accomplish the Great Commission, that he had to make these changes, these adaptations in how he's living and how he's explaining the gospel. He's the one that's changing, not requiring them to change except as they come to faith to be transformed by uh, Jesus living in them. And then we see him repeatedly referring to the fact that apostles don't stay forever. Um, they, might, they might only have to go 10 miles away, but once churches are on their own, Paul's not staying to be the long-term pastor of these churches. Even in, in, a, in a city like Ephesus, where he is for several years, we have to remember that they're planting essentially hundreds of house churches in that city. Paul is not the, you know, the pastor of First Baptist Church of Ephesus. He's continuing to preach the gospel. He's making sure that disciples are being trained to, be, to obey Christ. And he's raising up, uh, I think, an increasing number of uh, house church leaders there in the city. Uh, so he's laying the foundation of the church in that city. And this is how he sees his role. This is a principle that guides uh, so much of what he does. Now, Paul actually makes numerous references to plans. He, he did make plans. He had plans. He shares those plans with other people on a regular basis. So one was he had a plan to make a return visit to those churches in Galatia where they had preached in Acts 13 and 14. They had, a, they had even appointed uh, leaders in those churches, and yet he feels he still needs a little bit more connection with them, and so he made a plan to go back through that area. Um, he has a plan that he wants to come and encourage the church in, in Thessalonica, uh, where he, it appears, got run off before he really wanted to be, um, it, and maybe he was in that city, some, some scholars would say three to four weeks. It may be a little bit longer than that, but it's a very short time. And so Paul is, is thinking, you know, if, it, if at all possible, I want to get back there and continue to encourage these new believers. Uh, then they make this plan about the offering, uh, the gathering of this money from the Gentile churches to send back to Jerusalem and to take it back. There was, you know, couldn't go down to um, the first bank of Jerusalem in any of those cities and have it wire transferred or something like that, which would be so easy to do today. Um, no, they had to take the money. And, they, and there had to be several of them because they're carrying a large amount of money, uh, which was dangerous 
uh, what they were doing. But Paul had a plan. This is part of the plan. And, and carrying out this plan is going to take months uh, of time to do. But Paul sensed that this is what he was supposed to do. So they had a plan. Um, he writes to the church in Corinth and tells them that he has a plan to come back through, to travel through there, to see them again, to teach and encourage them uh, one more time, maybe not to be there as long as he was the first time, but Paul's concerned about him. He wants to see them again, and so he has a plan, and he mentions it here in his letters to them. And then we see in Rome and that he keeps referring to, I want to come through Rome, okay, right? I want to come through Rome. He hasn't been there yet. I want to be with you. I don't want to preach the gospel to you, to those of you in Rome. And then after that, you affirm and send me on to Spain. This is, and it, this looks like a plan that he had over a long period of time, trying to get to the sort of the end of the of the European continent uh, in this, you know, this sphere that he's trying to get to. Now, all of these are just these all are mentioned as plans that Paul uh, is trying to carry out, and sometimes things mess it up a little bit, but. Um, this is all plans in his mind as he's doing his ministry.